guess, yeah, we can get started now. So I think, uh, yeah, first up, we have the wonderful Alex Seiler. Um, so I think Alex is going to tell us a bit about um, Roman Britain and Assassin's Creed. Um, so I guess, yeah, take it away. Okay, excellent. So for this presentation, um, I just wanted to look a little bit at the reception of Roman Britain in Assassin's Creed Valhalla. So this game is the most recent in the Assassin's Creed series, which is a pretty long running game. Um, and its thing is sort of that uh, all of the games are set in historical time periods of some sort. Um, so there's been ones in like the American Revolution, um, recently one in ancient Greece, which was a lot of fun, um, ancient Egypt. And so this one is set in England um, in the very early medieval period. So between 872 and 878 AD. Uh, your protagonist is a Viking raider. Um, who has come to England with their community to establish a settlement there. Um, throughout the game, you explore early medieval Britain in your quests to forge alliances and protect your community um, and uncover some big mystical mysteries as well. Um, so because it is set in this early medieval period of Britain, there is a lot of sort of the remains of Roman Britain present in the game. Um, it's not set in a period when Britain was occupied by the Romans, but it's set in a Britain that is sort of indelibly shaped by its Roman occupation. Um, and I think the game does a really good job of showing the impacts of Roman occupation on Britain and its history and its culture. So, some of the more fun things in the game, um, you get to see some major archaeological sites. We're looking right now at a screenshot view of Hadrian's Wall, um, or what's left of it, um, up in the north of Britain. Um, it also is the sort of northernmost part you can go in the game. So, like the Roman Empire, it's sort of the limit of what you can reach, um, which I thought was really interesting. Um, this is just one of sort of many Roman ruins that you encounter in the game. Um, they're just everywhere, all over the world, and they're being used or ignored by the inhabitants of Britain in really interesting ways. Um, one of the more interesting things was one of your uh, like main quests takes you to the home of like a local lord who lives in this restored Roman villa, essentially, that you can see here. Um, so it didn't get super ruined. It's been upkept. And he and his family and sort of the people around him just sort of move in and use this building, which I thought was really interesting. Um, you see throughout that the people of Britain interact with Rome in really interesting ways. Um, Another particularly fun one is uh, you have someone who lives in your settlement who's essentially like a Roman enthusiast. He collects he collects Roman artifacts that you bring to him. Um, and although his name is Osbert, he has renamed himself Octavian um, because he's so enthusiastic about Rome. Um, there is also what seems to be a pretty direct reference to Nennius in one of the side quests that you can do. Um, so the side quest is called The Madness of the Stones. Um, your protagonist, Eivor, is asked by an NPC to count the number of stones that are in a circle. Um, and so you go around and you count them and you tell the NPC the number, and then he asks you to count them again. And you do it twice more, and every time the number is different. Um, this pretty immediately reminded me of uh, Nenny 73 on that tomb called Irking. Um, when he says, and men came to measure the tomb in length, um, sometimes it was six feet, sometimes it was nine, sometimes it was 12, sometimes it was 15. Um, so I thought that that really showed that the game devs did their research, um, because it seems like that very likely would have been taken from that. And I thought that was just like a really interesting way of using the ancient literature about a place to inform what they the world that they created for the game so all that said why does this reception matter um i think it did really just a really great job of demonstrating the immense impact that rome had on early britain 
um, one of the things that was mentioned in the article that I presented on for this class was that Rome sort of became part of a British cultural identity and their history with Roman imperialism um, sort of led to them identifying with the Romans and the Roman imperial past in Britain was used to sort of explain and justify British imperial imperial like the British imperialism period um, which I thought was really interesting and so I thought that the game did a really good job of showing how that identification began to happen like way back in Britain's history. Additionally, um, video games can be used as a teaching tool. This is becoming more and more popular and common. Um, and they're a really great pedagogical tool because they make information accessible and enjoyable. Um, they're a great way to get someone interested in a time period. Um, and they're a great way to engage a class that might not be as interested in learning the material through more traditional means um, by making it interactive and really immersive. Um, and so I think that it's really cool that even though we can't go to Roman Britain in this game, we can see the impact that Rome had on Britain. And that is what I've got. That's awesome. I love the uh, <laughs> the Roman enthusiast guy. <laughs> I know he's so funny. <laughs> Wait, so uh, how do you feel like um, the game has kind of shaped your experience of this class personally? Like just thinking back to um, the uh, you know using it as a teaching tool and that kind of thing. I think it definitely has. Um, so I played most of the game before this class. I played a lot of it while I was recovering from surgery in November. Um, <laughs> And like, we would do, we would talk about things in class and I'd be like, oh, I kind of remember that um, from, from the game. So that was kind of a lot of fun. It would, they would talk about like a place or something and I would be like, oh, I know where that is <laughs> um, from running around this map of medieval Britain <laughs> virtually. So that was really fun. Yeah, cool, totally. Yeah, I guess we can open it up. Um, we have what, like five minutes for Q&A? Um, okay, yeah, so anyone uh, yeah, thoughts or questions? Uh, throw one out there. I'm interested, you mentioned uh, the pedagogical value of games like this one, and I, I can see how you picked, the, uh, picked up on that for, the, for a class like this where it relates so directly. I was wondering, in your experience, if you're familiar with the use of big name games like this at all in uh, the teaching of classes, be it at the secondary or post-secondary level. Um, I can offer real quick that I've been in a class once where an independent, like an indie game, was used as a teaching tool, but that's the closest I've seen. So. I haven't, so I haven't personally experienced it. Um, I've heard about a lot of people, especially at the post-secondary level, um, starting to use games as teaching tools, um, sort of informally, like I'm on Classics Twitter, for example, and I've heard from professors there that they're doing similar things with other games that have classical reception in them, like um, Assassin's Creed Odyssey or um, Supergiant's Games Hades, which just came out this past year um, and is an absolute blast to play also. Um, so I think that it's something that's like starting to grow in popularity and really isn't like a, a big thing yet, but I think it is something that has a lot of potential. And I thought that the work that I've seen people doing with it just through these sort of informal channels is really cool. Thank you. Um, I just like to make a comment. I I love the presentation because um, of course Thank I you. played. Yeah, I played this video game. Yep. And it, indeed, it was an amazing visual uh, experience uh, when it came to the Roman ruins. Um, yeah, I wonder what you thought about the fact that not only did they place the Roman ruins in all over the game, but they made them, well, obviously we know the king moved into that Roman palace and that may or may not have been historically accurate, but they placed some very, very important like stuff, like pages that you could read, information about yep. Assassin's Creed, all inside of um, abandoned Roman uh, ruins. And I wonder if you thought that was kind of interesting or if it like, if if you think they conscient conscientiously did that when when they put important stuff in Roman ruins, yeah. Yeah, like I don't know if they um 
I guess we're thinking about like any sort of larger like themes like the imperialism and stuff but I think that um at least from a game continuity standpoint it makes sense since um like two games ago was set in like Roman Egypt um so I think that like they probably did it mostly because a they knew that players were going to have a lot of fun exploring these old places and seeing what was inside of them um and because we're in Britain, it makes the most sense for most of these ruins to be Roman, um, if not, you know, pre-Roman. Like, there's also, like, stone henges throughout um, that sort of form a similar purpose, um, but they don't give you as much information about the in-game universe. Um, so I think it was mostly, like, a, a play like a, a play style choice, um, but I did think it was very interesting. Uh, I'm pleased to be able to introduce for our next presentation, Alexa Christ, who will be presenting on Celtic Queens and Women's Wrath. Okay. Um, when translating Tacitus's Annales, a specific line stuck with me. It was Boudicca's final words as she rallied her army against the Romans. When describing battle, she stated, this is a women's matter. Let the men live and be slaves. Here, Boudicca, or rather Tacitus, established rebellion and militancy as a female matter. However, within the context of the Annales in the larger Roman society, this is not in fact Tacitus giving Boudicca a feminist exclamation for female empowerment. In ancient contexts, female anger is more often than not depicted by male authors as lethal and dangerous, whether it be a real account or fictional. Anger is an innate human emotion, but feminine rage has its own subgroup. It is ancient and ancestral. It is the rage that comes with being a woman mistreated based solely on their sex, and it is rooted in injustice and inequality. As we know, Boudicca was severely slighted upon her husband's death. She was set to inherit the Iceni throne, yet the Romans seized control of her kingdom, and in an act of conquest, they had Boudicca beaten and her two daughters raped. This violation of her body and her daughter's bodies only served to inflame Boudicca's anger. In response, Boudicca raised the Iceni and the neighboring tribes, the Trinawantes and the Catavallauni, for her revolt. As we read in the Annales, Boudicca's reasoning for waging war was avenging her kingdom, avenging her body scarred with lashes, and avenging the chastity of her daughters. In the ancient Roman and medieval times, Boudicca was described as a savage, barbaric queen with uncontrolled rage, though Boudicca later became a symbol of the 1908 women's suffrage movement in Britain, as well as a symbol of the British fighting spirit. Christabel Pankhurst, a renowned women's rights activist, led the suffragettes in a call to arms, inspired by Boudicca's rebellion against the Roman imperialists. They even carried a Boudicca banner during their marches. Subversive women were especially looked down upon if they were mothers, as they were being assertive and forceful when they were supposed to be comfort bearers and caretakers, a representation of women doing not as they're expected. Thus, Boudicca was the perfect idol, as she was both a militant and a mother. The suffragettes drew upon ancient symbols of female rage to correct injustices. With the changing of the time, Boudicca's seemingly insatiable anger and acts of violence were now justified. The activists sought to destroy the long-held view of women as peacemakers. In popular media, extreme bouts of anger and violence are more often seen completed by men than women. Growing up, girls are conditioned that their anger is supposed to be quiet and suppressed, whereas for boys, external anger is expected and even encouraged. Soraya Chamale, award-winning author of Rage Becomes Her, The Power of Women's Anger, states in her TED Talk that girls learn to be deferential and anger is incompatible with deference. Thus, female rage is equated with deviance, while male rage is widely accepted. When women are shown to possess stereotypical male traits in ancient literature, it is meant to be taken with disgust. Clymenestra, in the fictional tale of the Arestia, exhibits qualities usually attributed to men to make her more unlikable, and her murder more justifiable. She is overpowered by rage and vengeance over the death of her child at the hand of her husband Agamemnon, and so she kills him. The case of a wife killing her husband or a Celtic queen waging war on account of rape is wholly perverted to a Roman audience because a woman's reasons for revenge are never en enough to be justified. In their eyes, a woman's rage, let alone a mother's rage, is a threat. It has the potential for extreme irreversible change in addition, there is a theme of women being inept or unjust rulers due to their innate womanly qualities or lack of male traits. Tacitus explained that Boudicca possessed a greater intelligence than most women, and that intelligence is what made her dangerous and violent. Another Celtic queen, Cartamandua, 
was afflicted with what Antonia Fraser, author of The Warrior Queens, describes as the veracity syndrome, in which women are believed to be intrinsically promiscuous and are prone to sexual gluttony. Tacitus in Histories labels Cartamandua an adulterer with a certain lust and a savage temper. Though Cartamandua acquired a legal divorce from her husband, and her union with her second husband was most likely political, she is brandished an adulterer. In these accounts, her fault lies in her womanly promiscuity, and as a result is not fit to rule. Historians now suggest that Cartamandua's alliance with her second husband was a political move, as her first husband became anti-Roman and a threat to the safety of the Brigantes. In Roman accounts, she was the opposite of Boudica. She yields to Roman rule without a fight to ensure the survival of the Brigantes. She was peaceful and submissive, Boudica radical and angry, and both were depicted as incompetent rulers. As a woman in a leadership position, you are damned if you do, damned if you don't. As we have seen before, the past and the present cannot be so easily untangled. Boudica is now taught as a forceful, strong Celtic queen, while Cartamandua is lesser known in the textbooks. I attribute this to the fact that a tale of female rage is more satisfying to experience. It bursts out in an explosive way, and it's pleasing because it's vindictive but warranted. It comes from centuries of both suppression and oppression, so you feel the weight of it. It is even more gratifying when ancient sources can accurately encapsulate contemporary issues. The theme of a woman's rage is a timeless one. Female anger, at the end of the day, is about action, about change, and not a drop of it should be wasted. I'll conclude with the sentiment that hell truly hath no fury like a woman scorned. Yeah, that's excellent. Thank you. Yeah, she, that's a, it's a really interesting character, Boudica. I, I wonder when she's presented in Tacitus' histories, if we're supposed to wonder how is she supposed to act in response to what was done. Yeah. Uh, she she behaves like a almost like an anti Achilles or female Achilles, but should we have expected any less? But I shouldn't hog the response time. Does anyone have any questions for Alexa? That was just really well done. Thank you. Um, so we have Anastasia up next, who's going to tell us a little bit about um, bardic inspiration. The word bard conjures images of instruments, sharing stories by a fire, and traveling parties. But what did bards actually do, and how are they still relevant today in an age of written word and technology? While one would be hard-pressed to find a true bard today, the remnants of bards remain in the oral tradition of poets and singers. Even more true to the bards of the Celtic world are those in the tabletop role-playing game Dungeons and Dragons. In order to understand the extent of inspiration that not only bards, but the Celtic world in general has on Dungeons and Dragons, one must first understand the role and history of Celtic bards in their original setting. Beginning with the very word, the possible etymology for bardos is the Indo-European root gerdos, which is usually translated as praise giver. Bards themselves were poets and storytellers who went through extensive training at bardic colleges. They would train in these institutions for 12 years and were responsible for memorizing poems, stories, and songs. Bards were held in high esteem, variable on their skill and nationality, but even the highest bard was still deemed to be lesser than a druid who held more spiritual and religious significance. In Wales, bards could hold more power and esteem than hereditary princes, but in Ireland they needed to become the highest level of bard called an olam in order to come close to juridic levels of respect. As stated earlier, bards were required to go to 12-year colleges to train and master their craft. Curricula varied from nation to nation, but in Ireland, the curriculum was as follows. In the first year, new bards learned basic grammar, 20 stories, and the Ogham tree alphabet. They would begin as a principal beginner called an Olaire and work up first to a poet's attendant, a Taman, and then an apprentice satiricist, Drizak. For the next four years, Students would learn 10 stories for each year, 40 in total, 100 algum combinations, diphthongal combinations, more complex grammar, 12 philosophical lessons, and an unknown number of poems. In the sixth year, 
they would be called a pillar and would learn 48 more poems and 20 stories. Up through the ninth year, they would be called a noble stream, learn 95 tales, and study prosody, gloss, prophetic invocation, styles of composition, and specific forms of poetry. In the final three years, bards who followed the path of learning and study could become an olam, which in modern terms could be classified as a doctorate of poetry. At this point, they would have an arsenal of 350 stories in total, as well as satires and poems. Large bardic assemblies began around 1176 BCE, and these assemblies later became known as Estefod. In the 12th and 13th centuries, Wales saw an influx of bardic poetry, the philosophy of which was later mixed with Christian beliefs in the late 16th century by Llewellyn Sion of Bardas. In Scotland, a bard was a highly trained poet in the service of a hereditary chief, and in Celtic literature, bards are generally shown as having considerable status and authority, yet are also portrayed as poor and impoverished, not unlike many PhD students today, I will note. In Irish, Scottish, and Welsh literature, over a thousand bards are cited with and without titles such as Bard of Ireland. Later, in the 16th and 17th centuries, the title Last of the Bards was bestowed posthumously to several poets from Ireland, Wales, and Scotland. Unfortunately, some of the best information we have on bards are mentions in written stories and myths, less so an actual description of bards and their details. This, however, makes sense as the bardic tradition is an oral one, and therefore a written history of them and their stories is not easily found, if at all. Now that background and history have been established, we can move on to how this applies to Dungeons and Dragons. In the tale, The Great Battle of Mog Tered, as told by Lady Gregory, this scene plays out in which a magical harp is called by its owner from a wall, and while it flies to him, it ends up killing nine men. A direct connection to this idea of a magical and dangerous harp is the Harp of the Bards from the Forgotten Realms universe in D&D. It is also called the Alarm the Alam Harp, which, as stated earlier, is the highest type of bard one could train to be. The Alam Harp is the most powerful instrument of the bards and can only be used like a, by a bard, like the harp listed above. This harp is also a magical item and was first created by the legendary bard Philater, who used it to test and reward students at his own bardic college. All of these elements are direct links to the bards of old down to the names and institutions. D&D also takes inspiration from myths and legends of the Celtic world as seen by this list of monsters within the general D&D universe. The Bargest from Northern England, the Brownie from Scotland, the Drow also from Scotland, the Fearbulg from Ireland, the Will-O-Wisp from Scotland, and the wyvern from Saxon England, coming from the Saxon word vivier, meaning serpent. There are also four classes of D&D that one can play as, which are based off of Celtic culture and social classes, including the barbarian class, which is based off of the movie Conan the Barbarian, which was, again, based off of the Highland Scots, the bard class, the druid class, and the sorcerer class, which is based off of Welsh tales of Merlin. So why does this matter? The making of music and inspiring others with stories and tales is an age-old tradition, and without recognizing the source of such things, one will never be able to fully appreciate where we are now and how we got here. Whether that refers to Dungeons and Dragons, modern music, or the popularity of vines and TikTok, which could be argued to be a new source of oral tradition, but that's for a different presentation, the ideas and qualities of bards live on, albeit muted, and perhaps one day could be resurrected. Also, I just want to really quickly point out that these dice have tiny little lutes in them, and that's very important. Well, thanks so much, Anastasia. I really love the comparison of bards to PhD students. Um, and yeah, that's just really interesting how you can track the influence all the way from the ancient times through the Christian period up until the modern day. Are there any other questions for Anastasia or comments? I have a question. Um, so um, 
Wow. wow. Okay, I'm sorry if you already mentioned this, but do you know what the infrastructure for this training and this schooling was like? Um, you know, were the buildings part of like other schools or was this like a separate school on its own and stuff like that? So as far, um, as far as I was able to find, they were specifically Bardic colleges. Like I don't think they were interwoven into other academic institutions. Um, I wasn't able to find a whole lot on them, but what I did find uh, and what I could get from it, it seemed to be they were separate things. Thank you. Uh, Jeanette has her hand raised. <laughs> yes, hello. Um, I was just wondering if you knew um, if like the creators of Dungeons and Dragons actually had any like classics or, uh, you know, medieval studies backgrounds, if they were just kind of pulling from whatever or if they had actual uh, scholastic foundations for the stuff that they took when creating the system for D&D. Yeah, so I don't know for sure if they had um, like degrees in it, but I feel like it's safe to assume that it was at least something that they self-taught. Um, a lot of Duns and Dungeons and Dragons comes from other pop culture, um, Lord of the Rings, uh, Narnia, I think, like a lot of stuff like that, but also Greek mythology, Norse mythology, and Celtic mythology. So I feel like it's safe to assume that even if they didn't have academic background in it, they created Dungeons and Dragons. I feel like they're nerdy <laughs> enough that that doesn't really matter. Fair enough. Fair enough. Thank you. Uh, can I throw a quick question out? Uh, what was the social function of the Bardic Colleges slash the Bard? Sorry if I missed this in the presentation. But yeah, typically when there's a highly educated group, be it the wealthy Romans of the Roman period or, or the later clergy, there's some sort of purpose in investing so much time and education in young people like that? Or there seems to be. Do we see anything like that with the bards? Yeah, so from what I could gather, um, bards were taught by bards. Um, so it's kind of like a guild sort of thing, um, apprenticeship fellowship moment. And the main reason for having more bards, not only for entertainment and um, in like court, um, but the fact that they did keep histories and didn't write it down, they were very strongly against writing it down, which is why we don't have a whole lot of it, um, is that was the way that history and tales could continue. So you would have to train more bards cards to continue hearing the stories. I couldn't really find a different purpose for them or more purposes for them other than kind of like basically acting as historians without writing anything down. Uh, I am a little just real quick confused there. Uh, wasn't part of the education you described writing letters? So what's the purpose of learning to write letters if everything you do yeah. is they learn the alphabet but they're i couldn't find anything about them actually writing it it was more being able to read but not so much write i was also confused about that to be fair um well don't they don't they not write it down because i think that they mentioned that and i don't know if it's true necessarily for the irish because this was about the gauls but in de bello gallico they mentioned explicitly that they were not supposed to write down the poetry. Right. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah, I wish that I could answer why the Ogham alphabet was included in their instruction, but I honestly don't really know why since they weren't allowed to write anything down. I feel like maybe that would just be a waste of time then because you wouldn't be able to use it. So the title of my presentation is um, Massalia, um, influence, Greek influence among the Celts. Um, so Massalia was founded in 600 BC in modern day Marseille. Marseille um, and it was a colony of Phacaia, a Greek Ionian state in Asia Minor. Um, because of this colony, 
the Celtic world was in contact with the Greeks from a fairly early period. And one might argue that it actually went back even further because the Etruscans um, imported Greek items before that, uh, mostly in the form of wine and wine drinking or wine serving pottery. Um, Massalian traders, however, started to displace the Etruscan traders in the last half of the sixth century BC. And they traded fine ware ceramics and eventually started to produce their own wine locally, which they then traded um, the point being that the majority of what they traded was wine related and Dietler takes this as one of the major cultural borrowings from the Greeks. The other main one was Greek pottery manufacturing techniques, but as Dietler notes, what is interesting is that despite the wide range of possible Greek models, the Celts only imitated um, a couple different kinds. Um, and if you aren't careful, it might be easy to think you see um, Greek influence in artistic designs for these ceramics when it might not necessarily be. Um, that's something that Constance Witt has criticized some scholars of doing. This is an example of some side-by-side -side line drawings um, taken from Greek and Celtic motifs, um, which appear to look pretty similar, but Witt has noted that these designs, uh, when they were presented, were kind of removed from their context. Um, and so things like date, base type, location, anything that might give more information is missing. So it's sometimes misleading to say that, oh, this was Greek influence um, in reflected in Celtic art. Um, and I'll actu actually, a lot of older scholarship out there tends to see Celtic contact with the Greeks as Hellenizing or even like civilizing. Um, but the perspective of other scholars has more recently pushed back against that to point out that instances of influence seem to be more for the sake of expediency than, say, an adoption or assimilation of Greek culture to the local Celtic culture. So um, the Celts have their own identity and they just use Greek wares or even the Greek alphabet like on some of the grave stelae. Um, to express their own cultural identity. So one can think of it as more a Celtization of Greek objects than the Hellenization of Celtic culture. The diffusionist idea of the Hellenization of the Greeks um, is also pretty problematic. Um, like some have argued that while Greek contact did lead to the crystallization of identity, it was the identity of the other. Um, like the Greeks would see themselves, or, or the Celts, sorry, would see themselves through Greek eyes as the other. Um, this view um, is not only a product of Renaissance thought, most likely, but also just the result of a Hellenocentric, Hellenocentric bias, because um, most of the perspectives we have are through the Greeks. Um, and so the Greeks who lived at Massalia called the natives inhabiting the area the Ligurians. And according to Hodge, the Ligurians uh, have conventionally been viewed as like the worst type of barbarians. They had a long history of brigandage, which got them a lot of bad press from Massalia. And so they were exaggerated as being super uncivilized. But in reality, they actually developed some urban planning that, again, probably borrowed elements from Greek architecture. Um, it wasn't always like the image of, of little huts. Um, um, some of the remains. Um, an example from the uh, Salis capital, um, it had rounded projecting towers that might reflect Greek influence. And the whole city is organized on a grid plan, as you, on a grid plan, um, as you can see, which closely resembles the Greek Hippodamian system. Um, Massalia is the closest Greek colony to the Salis capital. But we don't know a lot about um, what its actual layout was like. So it's still possible that this grid plan um, was a native independent development. So at the end of the day, there was a certain amount of cultural borrowing, and this might be termed influence. Um, but it doesn't really carry any like moral judgment. Um, it's easy to fall into the rut of thinking kind of through the lens of the Greeks. Um, and um, but the, the, the Celts weren't really a homogenous group of barbarians, and um, they had their own cultural identities and own 
ways of using material culture for the expression of those identities. So yeah, that was my presentation. Uh, I have a question. It's kind of a clarifying question. Um, so you mentioned those those drawings are we don't have them in the like context, correct context. So we don't know if they were on pots or buildings or where they were. So. Yeah, at least yeah, at least from like your, the source um, that uh, Constance Witt was criticizing, um, the scholar presented it in this kind of maybe misleading format because you see a bunch of random lines that kind of approximate the same shapes. You might think, oh, this is a clear example of Greek influence on Celtic art. Um, but, but other scholars have kind of come back and said, um, you know, there, it's more like sometimes there's appropriation of Greek artistic styles, but ultimately um, there's a lot that isn't replicated and what is um, is kind of taken and used in a very unique Celtic art artistic style. So I have a question as well going off of that. Um, in reference to to those materials, I think you had referred at some point to a Celticization of Hellenic culture. Um, my understanding was that was in reference to artifacts that are Celtic, uh, making use of something Hellenic to uh, portray their own culture. I'm wondering if there's any Celtic influence that we actually see on uh, Marsalian or yeah, you know, Marsalian artifacts, uh, or if their sort of self-assumed cultural supremacy got in the way of that process. Yeah, um, so I, I didn't really look much into seeing if there was any of the like reverse influence. Um, but that's probably true. I think that um, the Greeks kind of saw themselves as, you know, just inherently superior and so thus presented themselves that way. Um, so, yeah, I would say, yeah. Thank you for your question. OK. If there are not, we can move on to our next presenter, who is Colton, our resident linguist, and he will be talking about the Indo-European origins of Celtic first. Take it away. OK, so I'm going to try to go a little quickly because I'm this is sort of a complicated topic and I want to try to get to everything, but I might not. So um, all right, so in uh, the question of the origin of meter in Celtic poetry is a rather interesting and complex one. Uh, Watkin, Calvert Watkins seminal 1963 paper argued that contrary to previous consensus, the insular Celtic meters, that is Welsh and Irish, did not arise independently in Britain, but were likely a continuation of an earlier Indo-European poetic tradition. Um, the fundamental problem in linking the metrical systems of languages like Greek and Sanskrit is the fact that those languages are tonal. Um, and Antoine Maillet, proved uh, conclusively in, I think it was 
So um, my real full title is Tattooing and WOAD in Roman Britain. Um, and what influenced my uh, presentation for today is, is this kind of this ubiquitous embrace of body modification by uh, numerous ancient and modern cultures and peoples. It seems that throughout human history, people have always felt the need to mark their bodies, either to stand out or to feel more included, to claim or reject identity, to support or resist institutions, or to simply look cool. I love that desire, that curiosity, that need. And uh, while I was unsurprised by it, I was quite pleased to read that people in Roman Britain also practiced body modification, specifically tattooing. So today I uh, set out to introduce tattooing in Roman Britain to you. To do this, I will essentially be summarizing an article by Julian Carr titled Woad Tattooing and Identity in Later Iron Age and Early Roman Britain. Um, and that article goes into much greater detail about the craft. Okay, so the first thing Carr tackles um, is the physical evidence from um, sites. Um, and uh, the biggest artifact that people get from there um, related in, to this field is uh, something that is used to make tattoo pigment. Um, and the device is called a cosmetic grinder. Um, so the grinder is a small cast bronze crescent shaped object uh, about 5 to 11 centimeters in length. Um, and when it's complete, it consists of two parts, a mortar and a pestle. So um, I will share my screen now to show you pictures of what this uh, tiny little um, tool looks like. Um, yeah, this is slow. Um, okay. Um, should work. Can people see? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, so this is this is this is a crescent shaped um, cosmetic grinder. Um, uh, I would like y'all to note the sharp uh, ends that it has, um, and this essentially is uh, where you kind of string the pestle through and. I don't know, grind stuff, um, but we'll, we'll come back to the sharp ends of these devices in a bit. OK, so now I stop sharing. OK, so this instrument has uh, come to be considered Roman, but Carr quite firmly establishes that this claim should no longer stand. Her central point is that these, these grinders have not been found anywhere else in the Roman world except Britain and Northern Gaul and that it is highly likely that the Romans acquired it from the Britons rather than the other way around. OK, so now let's start this whole tattooing process. So first we need to produce our pigment. Um, and uh, it, we'll see that in this process, uh, the cosmetic grinder is uh, featured. So Carr and now myself, we refer to this pigment as WOAD because the blackish indigo color is, uh, is a product of the WOAD plant. So here's the process. Um, this is like a nice recipe. Um, so step one, you chop woad plants, then you boil uh, it in water and leave it to steep for an hour. Then you strain the liquid and you dispose of the plant matter. Then you have to add ammonia to the liquid until it reaches a pH of nine. I'm quite interested to know how um, the British people, uh, the Britons kind of established the pH level. Um, I also apologize for the planes coming through. The worst time for planes to be coming through. Um, okay. So, okay, after you add the ammonia, you stir the liquid in the air for about 10 to 15 minutes until blue particles appear on top. You gotta let the particles settle for an hour and then decant. Uh, so that'll leave the sediment. The sediment. Um, sorry about the planes, everyone. This is a particular problem in the ski. Okay, so at the bottom, you will be left with um, an indigo colored powder. Um, so the seventh step is to powder that indigo even further, to grind it further. Um, and it's, so it's in these... Can you all hear the plates or is this just, you know, does this not come through on teams? Yeah, we can hear them. Yeah, it's terrible. Um, someone wrote a weird uh, newspaper article about how this is a particular problem in these parts. Um, Okay, so it's in the final stages of this um, 
pigment making process that um, we, we, we get um, that we'd use a cosmetic grinder uh, to essentially grind up the dried indigo product and make it suitable for use in tattoos. So there is possibly one other use for the cosmetic grinder, um, as it was probably used to also mix this uh, product, this powder, with a liquid binding agent. Uh, and that brings us to the next stage in the tattooing process. So a binding agent or simply an agent is the liquid medium in which pigment is transferred into the skin. So even today, uh, in modern times, all tattoo pigments exist in a liquid agent, usually made out of products derived from animals, though vegan agents are now finally being developed and used in shops. So ask your tattoo shop next time you're in there. Um, the, the Britons, of course, definitely used just uh, animal products to contain the woad indigo. Uh, so some examples of their products are milk, beef dripping, egg yolk, um, plain old water, and occasionally even semen. I'm not gonna unpack that in this presentation, but apparently it was used every now and then. Okay, so now finally we get to apply the tattoo. So let's talk about the required paraphernalia. First, we require a razor because as people with tattoos here might know, you cannot tattoo a body part without having it shaved completely. Hair diverts needles, interferes with the flow of ink, and can even cause infection to the open wound. So next, uh, the cosmetic grinder can again play a role. So the sharp end of the cosmetic grinder, which I um, kind of made you pay attention to earlier, it can be dipped in ink um, and used to draw designs onto the person getting the tattoo, so like a stencil. Um, and then the last required items are, of course, uh, the needles. Um, archaeological digs have found bone needles stained with the blue-green color that you might expect from Moad. Um, there have also been sets of forks riveted together. They could also, also be potential tattooing instruments. Um, and then there's another tool uh, comprising of six thin toothed, toothed bronze plates that have been found. Um, and that particular instrument is actually quite similar to Maori tattooing ch uh, chisels. So essentially, it seems that um, Britons from the uh, Roman Britain time used multi tooth tattooing instruments as uh, the ones described above, um, especially for designs that had many parallel lines. Again, this is very similar to modern tattooing machines that can contain anywhere between three and 25 needles. Um, so the predominant techniques for tattooing included, like I said, drawing the design on the skin using a cosmetic grinder. Uh, and then pricking it over with the needles. Or, and this is weird because I actually, it's painful to kind of visualize this, or you could have a colored thread with colored with the powdered pigment and then ha and then draw it under the skin with a needle. So it almost looks, uh, seems like you're sewing uh, the skin with ink. Um, but yeah, that is my uh, 101 on um, Roman Britain tattooing. Um, and I think the, uh, I will leave you all with I can't really leave you without examples of some tattoos on old uh, Roman people. So I'm about to share my screen again um, to show you what that they found uh, quite a few examples of face tattoos on Romans, on their, uh, on Britons, on their coins. So can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. So here are our face tattoos. So. Um, they were uh, super common um, then, apparently, and they were popular. Um, it, is, it is interesting to think about how the Romans might have thought of this, because Romans, of course, also did face tattoos, but for a completely different reason. Um, it was completely punitive, um, so it was only for slaves or um, servants or criminals. So, um, yeah. Okay, that's my presentation. Um, are there questions for me? Oh, there's a hand, Jeanette. Yes, hello. So those depictions of facial tattoos that you showed, are those actually representative of anything or are they just like ambiguous designs? Like would they get actual? Right. Um, so so uh, so Carr, who writes this article, does kind of um, make um, hypotheses about it. Um, definitely seems like um, it could be a family crest. It could be, it, she also talks about how tattooing in general could have become, a, is was a very exclusive art form. Only f few people knew how to do it, um, probably because either because of class structure or simply because craftsmen were proud and didn't share their secrets. Um, so getting a certain type of tattoo could also symbolize that you were part of a particular tattoo family um, or a particular tattoo um, group of artists. Um, yeah. Very cool. Yeah. Thank you. 
Um, I'll throw out there real quick that sewing. I feel like I've heard of that sewing tattooing. I'm trying to look up it's the oat man, right? Or oat man. Let's see the ice man right now. The mm-hmm. Olympic guy that was covered in tattoos to see if that's right. Right. Yeah, it looks like this sort of tattooing goes way far back. Um, I did have one little question. Did you say beef drippings at some point in what gets mixed with the? Yes, yes, beef drippings. Um, what is beef drippings? I, I can't. <laughs> I can't really tell you. I I, I just. I, I should look it up. I, I don't really know, but usually tattoo agents, even even till today, tattoo agents are pretty disgusting things. Um, so I'm glad they're they're becoming vegan now. Um, but even till today, people still use like kind of oil from pigs meat and stuff like fat from pigs and stuff like that as as soluble agents. So yeah, Anastasia, you seem to have a question. Um yeah, so I apologize if you already went over this. Um, so much information, but. Were there like specific tattoo artists like we have today, or just could anybody give somebody any tattoo? There seems to have been a very, very specific um, tattoo um, artists or clans of people who knew how to tattoo and sometimes only tattooed themselves. So you'd only, they'd be like a very um, kind of closed in group of people who tattooed and got tattooed. Um, Cause again, People did not share their secrets of how to prepare the ink. This, like what I've described to you, is a very general process, obviously. And um, people always, even like, even till today, there are masters out there, like from Japan or who don't share their secrets on, on making ink. Sorry for the planes again. Um, and um, yeah, so it was, again, the same way I, I talked about how the tattoos they'd get would refer to a family crest or something, they, it, it was very likely that the markings would also represent the tattoo group that was tattooing. Yeah. Gotcha, yeah. Um, yeah, also just like a quick comment on the <laughs> beef drippings um, and stuff like that, even in modern ink. Yeah, there's totally, in some brands, there's um, like pig fat and stuff like that, which as someone who tries to keep kosher, like I have to look into that if I want to get a tattoo. I have to like email the tattoo artist and be like, what brand do you use? Yeah, yeah, no, I I, I also like the tattoos I have are from a vegan shop, like that's, that's the only one I go to, so um, yeah. We are moving on to Jeanette, who has a presentation for us on the cult of wells in Celtic myth titled, Where There's a Well, There's a Way. Yes. Um, I don't actually have like a little PowerPoint. So I wore my my nautical shirt, my, my like shell shirt, and behind me is a well, which I'll talk more about in my presentation. So you can feast your eyes upon that while, uh, while I'm going over this. Okay. <laughs> um, water is the lifeblood of our world. Yes, it sounds cliche, but it's true. Not only is water essential for survival, but it is also also widely considered the literal fons et origo, source and origin of life itself. Water has been an everlasting symbol of healing, fertility, and wisdom across time and cultures, and the Celts are no exception. There is, however, an emphasis in Celtic folklore on specifically wells as sacred sites, Um, that has lasted from as far back as Neolithic times to the present day. Though nowadays these pagan locales have been adapted to fit into a more Christian narrative, much of, and much of the oral traditions about their origins are lost, there are still the vestiges of old Celtic myth and magic that remain within them. So to understand the significance of wells in the Celtic tradition, um, you have to first understand what a well is. It's little more than the simple cobblestone structures that might come to mind when the word is mentioned. A well can be anything from a natural spring or pond or even a body of water as big as a lake um, to the more typical excavated man-made wells. Um, But they're always accompanied by a sacred hawthorn tree, uh, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Um, Despite their varying structures, their magical properties are also fairly similar across the board, falling into three main categories, sources of wisdom, sources of healing, and places of divine feminine power. 
uh, these ideas seem a little disparate. Uh, they are connected in folklore uh, more so than one might have believed prior. Um, just as the nature of life is cyclical and water is its source, the symbolism of the waters of a holy well function the same. Um, the interconnectivity of wisdom, healing, and womanhood is apparent throughout Celtic myth. Uh, as a source of wisdom, water or the creatures that live within it um, that has a deep rooted Celtic tradition of being able to grant knowledge or insight. For example, uh, Finn McCool, uh, who's an Irish folk hero of the Fenian cycle, um, gained wisdom from eating a salmon imbued with knowledge from the other world, which is the Celtic realm of spirits. In another myth, the legendary King Cormac of Cormac's adventure in the land of promise, I was gonna put the Irish name in there, but I would not be able to pronounce it, so. Uh, was witness to the sacred well of Sergeis. I don't know if I pronounced that right. Um, the centerpiece of the other world uh, from which knowledge could be obtained by drinking its water. Uh, beyond just earthly wisdom too, there's a theme of wells hosting uh, oracular properties being locations of divination and prophecies. Um, wishing wells were divining sites rather than tossing a coin into the well. However, the inquirer would interpret the bubbles in the water or its level, the quality, uh, or even whether or not there were bugs or frogs or other creatures in the water to make predictions about the future. There's no clear evidence as to where this practice began, but something similar is seen in the Din Shen Kas. I don't know if I pronounced that right either. Uh, it's an early mythological topic topography of Ireland, um, which describes bubbles of wisdom in the water of the River Shannon, uh, which I thought was really interesting. Um, However, when it comes to wells being places of healing, it is most often in reference to diseases of or blindness of the eye. The connection to well water granting wisdom being that it is a metaphorical site extends to the literal granting of restoration of vision. The Celtic mother goddess Brigid, who was later redacted into the Irish Christian tradition as Saint Brigid, was said to have plucked out her eyes after being chased by an unwanted suitor which is a pretty gruesome tale, but following the eye plucking, she bathed the empty sockets in the water of a well, and her vision was said to have been restored. Wow, I guess I don't need an eye doctor if you could just go to a well. Terrible prescription. Um, but even now, there are still multiple wells in her name around Ireland, though most notably in Kildare, which is thought to be her hometown. Uh, whether or not these wells have actual healing properties is up for debate, but that does not diminish the fact that people still visit them seeking healing even today, uh, whether they be under the names of their Christian adaptations or otherwise. Petitioners oftentimes will leave cluties or cloths hanging from the customary tree or bush that accompanies the well after having soaked it in its waters and wrapping it around their wound or, or ailment. Um, as a symbol of the affliction, they want to be healed. As the cloth deteriorates, it's thought that the ailment too goes away, dissolved by the water of the well. Um, but cluties are not the only tokens that pilgrims will leave at these holy wells. Uh, votive offerings such as pins, berries, and branches and other natural symbols are also customary to be left at these sites. This practice harkens back to the pagan understanding that each and every well was under the guardianship of a nature spirit or goddess and always female. Such offerings would be made to pay respect to these well guardians as well as to speak to seek favors and healing as mentioned above. Um, in Celtic cosmology, the other world was regarded as a feminine domain as the earth was considered the embrace of the great mother goddess. Therefore, by extension, wells have this inherent connection to womanhood and fertility, being springs straight from the ground. Uh, some wells are even accompanied by Sheila Nagigs, which are apotropaic fertility figures associated with the great mother goddess. Uh, with the onset of Christianity, uh, these wells were adapted into the patronage of saints, either male or female. Um, and the meaning of the Shilina gigs faded into near obscurity, but the significance of the feminine origin of a well's power is undeniable. Um, and despite the alterations of time and crossover from pagan beliefs to the Christian religion, the magic of wells and their symbolism in the Celtic tradition remain a cornerstone of the culture today. The ideas of wisdom and healing and womanhood are so ubiquitous, uh, so ingrained into humankind, that it's no wonder that these facets were able to remain. You need only look to the water of a well. I think there's 
my presentation. So if anybody has questions. Yeah. Oh, this is St. Brigid's um, well in Kill Kildare, by the way. There it is. So I don't know if you can see it. It's got some some man-made structures, but it's a an open like teardrop pool. So. Yeah, we can turn it over to questions. So I guess Anastasia waiting already in the wings. <laughs> Hop on. All right. Um, so you mentioned like um, being like reading what was going on in the well to try and determine the future, like with the bubbles and the frogs. And I was just wondering, like, were you able to find anything about what different symbols would mean? I didn't see exactly what different symbols would mean um, in terms of that general divination. There were reports of specific wells being portents of different specific symbols. So there was this one well, I forget exactly where it was, but when the water receded, meant there was a royal. Specifically, um, it had to do with the hawthorn berries because the hawthorn berries that fell into the well of that was in the middle of the other world, the juices like it was the bubbles of wisdom. So that's how you could kind of tell from the bubbles. So I thought that was kind of interesting. I don't know if that answers your question. And next up, we have um, Jesse, who is going to tell us about the life of St. Patrick. So looking forward to that. Hi. Oh, my computer keeps being weird. Um, I'm going to share my screen. I hope it works. Um, how do I do that? Where do I go to share my screen? Oh, there's a button. Okay. Um, yeah, it should be like right next to the okay. button, I think. Okay. Can you guys see this? Uh, yes, we can. Okay, cool. Um, oh. My team's box went away. Can you guys see me? Yes, we can see and oh, hear you. Oh, okay. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, so I guess my, my subtitle is, uh, or my whole title is The Life of St. Patrick. And as I was going into my research and I was reading the confessions and um, his letter to Caroticus, I found some themes. And the first was that I found a lot of comparisons to Paul the Apostle. Um, from the Bible. So a lot of um, what I'm going to talk about is mostly um, comparing their two lives because I found a lot of parallels and I thought that was really interesting and about how both of them uh, dedicate their lives to preaching the gospel. Does it want to change slides? Oh, there we go. So the purpose of the confessions and his letter to Caroticus. So the confessions were, um, it's like a published uh, self-written testimony of his faith and his life. And his letter to Caroticus was, um, Caroticus was being really, uh, he was persecuting a lot of his followers and a lot of fellow Christians. And so he was writing to him saying, like, you guys need to stop. But he didn't just say, like, you have to stop doing this. He had a deeper meaning in his his letter and his confessions, which um, both of those were to preach the gospel to the Irish. And um, in his letter to Caroticus, he was also preaching the gospel to them. And in the, his confessions, he kind of sums this up saying so that that all of his purposes are so that he can come to the Irish people to preach the gospel and endure insults from unbelievers as they would come to him. So the major comparisons I found between Paul and Patrick. So for those of you who don't know, Paul uh, was a man who originally was called Saul in the Bible. And in Acts chapter nine, he is um, he's on his way to continue persecuting and killing Christians and he's encountered by God. He's encountered by Jesus. This is after uh, the resurrection. 
And Jesus says, like, Paul, why are you, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And it's this whole big thing. And Paul ends up converting to Christianity and following Jesus and drastically changes his life. And um, so the first parallel I found was feelings of humility and inadequacy, but not inadequacy in the in the way that like our culture thinks of inadequacy, more like recognizing your um, your fallenness and your um, like the the root of humility, like going back to the ground, like humus, like just realizing that they are dust and they both recognize that. Um, I don't know why I didn't put the quote in here, but from Confessions 11, um, St. Patrick says something about that. And Paul in 1 Timothy 1.15, he says, um, here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I'm the worst. Um, I had edits in here that are not in here. Um, oh, this is it. Okay. That's, this is the slide I want. Um, so Paul says, um, he says, last of all, as to one untimely born, he also appeared to me for I'm the least of the apostles unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God by the grace of God. I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. Um, and so both of them encountered God and drastically changed their lives. Patrick says in um, number three of his confessions, he says, therefore, I cannot keep silent, nor would it be proper so many favors and graces has the Lord deigned to bestow in me, um, bestow on me in the land of my captivity. For the ch after chastisement from God and recognizing him, our way to repay him is to exalt him and confess his wonders before every nation under heaven. Um, and so they both were very humble. They both um, encountered God and drastically changed their lives. Um in Acts chapter 9, that's where Paul changes his life and converts to Christianity. Both, interestingly, were shipwrecked, which uh, Patrick, um, he talks about in his confessions, and both really understood the meaning of repentance. So a lot of the parallels, like you could say that they're both just two guys who converted to Christianity and joined the mission like everybody else. But I was just struck by how similarly they wrote, how... Um, I mean, I myself as a Christian, having read a lot of what Paul has written, um, I'm really familiar with like his tone and the way he words things. And I was just really caught by how um, St. Patrick uh, said stuff very similarly. Um, and so just like this quote that I had read from First Corinthians, St. Patrick says, and there the Lord opened my mind to, my, to an awareness of my unbelief in order that even so late I might remember the transgressions and turn with, with all my heart to the Lord my God, who had regard for my insignificance and pitied my youth and ignorance. And he watched over me before I knew him and before I learned to sense or even distinguish between good and evil. And he protected me and consoled me as a father would a son. So I, I was really struck by how they both have a really deep um, reverence for repentance, which just means that you turn your heart toward God and, and from that your life changes. And both of them had stories that paralleled that. Um, and so in his confessions, and I know I'm giving, I'm kind of over time, I'll hurry up a little bit. Um, he talks about these visions he had and how in his testimony, he was a very uneducated man from the country. But that, you know, God, even God who created the country can use countrymen. Um, and he lets God use him at, to preach the gospel to the Irish people. And in his letter to Caroticus, um, this was the fruit of his faith that he talks about in Confessions. And one thing that I thought was interesting was that, um, so he's writing to uh, Caroticus saying, like, you guys have to change what you're doing. You can't live the way that you keep living. And you could see this as, as a lens of cultural relativism. Like, for example, he calls them barbarians, which is interesting. Um, and he's looking at their people and their culture and considering them evil. But this is a filtered view of what he says here. He's really looking beyond the surface of the culture and looking to the morality in the heart of the people. 
Every call to believe the gospel is a call to allow God to change the heart, which in turn changes lives. And for the Britons, this includes the cultural representations of not following God. And while it seems like a cultural attack, really the culture and the habits of the people are artifacts that represent the hearts of the people. Every culture, including modern day, has cultural artifacts that represent the nature of humanity. So what's the point of his argument? Well, at one point he says, what does it profit a person to gain the whole world yet suffer the loss of his or her soul? And it's this pull of the heart that he feels drawn to preach the gospel of Jesus to these people, the gospel that says that we are all broken and fall short and can only find peace and grace through accepting Jesus as Lord and Savior by faith alone. And it is this call to the gospel that I also feel called to preach and that I relate to St. Patrick in his distress over the outside world, especially living in Burlington. Um, and he says, anyone who believes will be saved and anyone who does not believe will be condemned. Um, yeah, and that's my project. Yeah, I thought it was super interesting. Um, Thanks, Jesse. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, sorry if I missed this, but um, one of my questions was, is there like evidence that St. Patrick, like before he was converted, um, of his views toward the Christians? Because I know like Paul was like persecuting the Christians. No. Was, was there anything like that for St. Patrick or was it just the conversion that you thought was similar between them? Um, I, I couldn't find as much about his life before he became a Christian because I think he converted pretty young. Um, it said that he was, I think he was like a runaway, maybe I misread this, like a runaway slave or something in Britain. Um, but that's as far as I could find just with the time I was was able to spend on the project. Um, but that is something I was, I was thinking about, especially because Paul was somebody who had persecuted Christians. And then you have, um, St. Patrick writing to Caroticus who is currently persecuting Christians. Yeah. So it was an interesting, um, parallel that I wish I could have spent more time on. All right. I guess that brings it to me. So I'm just going to quickly go through a bit of primary material, two ethnographies of Tacitus, one that we read for this class, the uh, brief ethnography of the Britons in the Agricola, <clears throat> and the other, uh, a longer form, um, and I'll turn to the next slide so you can see what I'm talking about here, a longer form ethnography of the Germans. Now, Tacitus's uh, Degemania is, I believe it has a much longer name than that, but it's a uh, it's a much longer book than just 27 chapters, but these 27 chapters encapsulate his sort of general ethnography of the Germans, after which it was my observation that he begins to go sort of tribe by tribe uh, within the divisions that he imposes at the beginning. So that is the first thing to take note of, is when we compare these two ethnographies, we find that for some reason, Tacitus only wants to go through four chapters to describe the Britons, and he spends 28 on the Germans. So if we want to understand why, we should start by breaking down sort of the topics that he discusses and in what order he discusses them. And so that's what I did. I went through and basically uh, put titles on the topics that he introduces and listed them out in the order that they're introduced. Now, in the case of the Britain's ethnography, he begins with an introduction stating why He's including this ethnography in a larger history of Agricola's campaigns in Britain. Uh, you guys may remember it. He says something along the lines of, I'm not contending with anyone's uh, eloquence. Uh, I simply feel the need to write because it is at this time, i.e. after uh, Agricola's campaigns, that Britain is thoroughly subjugated. So giving the impression now we know things for fact that we used to see as sort of uh, possibilities. He then turns to the geographical situation of Britain. You may remember him describing its shape uh, and sort of landscape, uh, the waters, the days, all those sorts of uh, geographical considerations. He discusses the physical characteristics of the people. Uh, he divides them in three and curiously says, the people in the north have red hair and blue eyes, so they're kind of like Germans. And the people in the Southwest, they have curly hair and they're kind of like uh, people from the Iberian Peninsula. And then the people in the Southeast, they're, they're pretty much just Gauls. I'm pretty sure they're just Gauls that came over. So he sort of subdivides 
the Britons. Um, he then transitions to their manner of warfare, their preference for infantry over cavalry, and a brief discussion of their um, use of chariots, um, after which he goes into sort of climate. It's distinct from geographical situation. He talks about the weather, what sort of crops can grow and in what abundance, uh, how easy it is to, to rear a flock there, and then what sort of metals are present and in what capacity even including a, a brief discussion of um, the pearls that are available there. And finally, he talks about the sort of cultural or spiritual character of the people of Britain. And we'll return to that point later on. So we don't have to go point by point with the Germans the same way we did with the Britons. But as we can see, it's not just that he covers these same few points in larger detail. He really does go into uh, a much greater diversity of topics in his uh, Germanic ethnography. But if we pause and I'll let you guys glance at this for just a moment, you may pick up on a bit of an overlap. So as we can see here, and I've highlighted these sort of for a one-to-one -one comparison, at the beginning of his German ethnography, he handles pretty much the same discussions and almost in the same order as the discussions uh, that comprise his uh, ethnography of the Britons. He talks about the geography of Germany, it's, or Germania and its shape. He divides the German people into three parts. Uh, curiously, somewhat close to our own understanding of Ostrogoths, West Scots, or not Ostrogoths, East Germans, West Germanics, and North Germanics. It's a little different, but uh, it, it does have some resonances there. He talks about their climate, how well they can grow crops and what sorts they grow, uh, the sorts of flocks that are there. He says you can grow large flocks, but the individual animals are small. He talks about the prevalence of iron and precious metals. And he talks about their own preferred manner of warfare, also being uh, preferring infantry and, and that sort of thing. Uh, after which, he goes into a bunch of other uh, topics that are more related to their government, culture, and society. So what's going on here? Why, why does he seem to start talking about the same things, but then cuts off the British ethnography? Uh, so I'm going to offer my own theory here. I think we can see a hint of why in the very uh, introduction I mentioned before, uh, and especially in what I just highlighted here, this emphasis on his reason for giving the British ethnography as being because they've been thoroughly subjugated. It creates this lens by which we're viewing the British ethnography as we're looking at a subjugated people and we're describing a subjugated people. And through that lens, the final point that is discussed becomes all the more uh, poignant. He's not just talking about the general spirit of the people and their culture and how they live. He really focuses in on how the Britons engage as subjects, how easy they are to be subjected. Uh, and this can sort of be compared to the much larger conversation on the German side of their own individual customs, habits, culture as a distinct people. So I'm going to present what I've highlighted in yellow here, the actual quote. Uh, he says, the Britons themselves attend energetically, we translated this line together, energetically to the levy, tribute, and imposed burdens of empire if abuses are absent. These they bear with difficulty, already having been conquered such that they obey, but not yet such that they should play the slave. So his whole description that I had marked as, as the, the character of the Britons is entirely in view of the Britons as Roman subjects. Uh, if we look at some of the points in this larger list of German habits, uh, we notice that that's not what he's describing. Clearly, the Germans are not subjects of the Roman Empire. And as uh, Caesar sort of makes clear in his um, ethnographies and his history of uh, in De Bello Gallica, uh, the Germans are sort of out of reach to a degree. Or at least larger Germania is something that the Romans are more and more giving up on ever conquering as the imperial period goes on. So when we look at the Germans, we're not looking at a people that are soon to be subjugated or have been subjugated by the Roman Empire. 
we're looking at a people that are uh, both culturally and civically distinct from the Romans. And so when we look at them, we almost see Tacitus viewing them through the lens of how they compare and contrast with Romans. So I picked out some examples here. Um, <clears throat> he marks ways in which they're very similar to Romans. Like he talks about these retinues of Germanic chieftains and how you're seen as more powerful in society depending on how many men follow you around every day, which reminds us of the Cleanse system in Rome. But then he'll talk about how they're very distinct. Uh, Rome is civilized partly because Rome is concentrated and urban, but the Germans are scattered and they, they don't prefer to come together into towns or cities. He'll talk about uh, things that sort of present Germans as caricatures and something to deride and make the Roman reader think that he is culturally superior. Uh, like he describes their propensity to drink beer, not wine, and drink a lot of it. He says this is a weakness of theirs you can exploit. So just give them a ton of beer. Uh, or, yeah, we'll leave it at that for that one. Or he'll give um, examples of things that are to be praised and emulated. Like he, he praises the fact that they have very strict cultural practices when it comes to monogamy. They deride what's called prostitute chastity. I assume he's referring to people um, having sex before marriage, maybe. Uh, but yeah, strict monogamy to death is something that he identifies as a Germanic practice and he extols. He also seems to more uh, slightly extol the fact that people don't flamboyantly mourn uh, when their loved ones die. Uh, and that's something he seems to have a positive view of. And then he, I can't tell if this is totally positive or negative, but he makes a very distinct uh, observation about how they don't push their slaves too hard. They treat them and freedmen and sort of a, as lower societally, but not a capital to be used the same way the Romans seem to see them. And they, he says they don't exploit capital to produce profit. Clearly, Rome is in mind when he makes that statement, but it's hard for me to tell when he says that. Is he saying this is a prescription and the Romans should be more like this? We should stop being so profit driven or is he saying look at these simple people they don't know how to make a profit the same way we do i can't say on that point but this brings me to the conclusion that as i sort of hinted at before we're looking at two very different ethnographies because we're looking at two very different purposes for ethnography the agricola can stop when it does with the description of how the uh, britons engage as subjects because when it comes to their culture and their civic institutions, I think, unfortunately, Tacitus is viewing all of those as something that will be blotted out and replaced by Roman culture and Roman civic, Roman civic institutions as Britannia becomes a Roman provincia. The German ethnography, on the other hand, to my eye, Um, so if there aren't any other like questions, comments, I guess we can turn it over to um, the incomparable Rachel Fickus, um, who is going to tell us about chariot horses, I believe. Yes, all right. Um, OK, I set out in my research to determine the physical characteristics of Iron Age British, Iron Age British horses. Um, so as we all know, Caesar describes the chariots of the Britons um, in several passages of his Gallic War, uh, remarking especially on their agility and speed and the fear they incited within his own soldiers. Unfortunately, though, he never describes the horses themselves. The horse seems to have held great importance in many Celtic cultures, including 
apart from the Britons. Um, the Germans with uh, Caesar's description as their, their ugly horses. Um, the Gauls with their Druidic horse rituals and the Celtic peoples in Spain. Um, Pliny the Elder writes that, uh, quote, also in Spain, the Galaic and Astorian tribes breed those of the horse kind that we call tildones, with a smaller form named ostrocones, which have not the usual paces in running, but a smooth gait, straightening the near and off side legs alternately, from which the horses are taught by training to adopt an ambling pace. The word here translated as ambling, a modern term for a specific type of gait in a horse, is the Latin tulotem, from tolo to raise up. Uh, this is really interesting because although Pliny's description could be interpreted to mean lateral pacing, which is a gait when a horse moves both left feet forward and then both right feet forward, um, the word it's, itself implies a true ambling gait, which is a four beat gait in which each hoof moves separately. Marshall also writes of the ambling astorco, um, quote, this small one who lifts his swift hoof in rhythms came from the gold bearing people the Astorian horse, end quote. The swift regular rhythm that Marshall talks about, again, bears to mind true ambling and not the lateral pace. Also, modern Astrocones, the feral ponies that still live in the Asturias, present a natural ambling gait. Uh, coins from Iron Age Britain show horses stepping with one front leg lifted high um, and all other feet down, which is an unnatural position in a non-gated horse but a common mark of an ambling gait. The modern Icelandic horse, which is known for its quick ambling gait called the tolt, which is cognate with Pliny's tildones. Um, it, the Icelandic horse has been isolated since its arrival in Iceland over 1,000 years ago with no outside horses introduced to the breed. So at least in the 900s, um, they were using gated horses. Uh, modern wild Faroe Island ponies and the now extinct Galloway ponies from Northern England also have ambling gates. All this evidence points to ambling British horses. The medieval and modern use of gated horses is primarily rider comfort because it eliminates the bouncing of the trot. Uh, you may have read in Arthurian tales of palfreys, which are ambling gated riding horses. However, gated horses also are known for their instant acceleration since they don't need such a powerful impulse as a cantering horse might. This would certainly be useful in a battle situation such as Caesar describes and could explain the surprising speed and agility of the British chariots. Aside from their gait, there is substantial evidence from bones and extant chariot yokes that the British horses were very small, likely around 12 hands or 48 inches high which makes sense in an environment with rocky sparse, sparse foraging. On British coins, riders are depicted with their feet hanging well below the horse's bellies. Also, a chariot snaffle bit from the first century CE in East Yorkshire uh, was only three inches wide, which is suitable only for a horse under 11 hands high and likely even smaller. Since Roman military horses of the time are estimated to have stood between 14 and 15 hands, uh, the modern equivalent of a large pony. These British horses would have seemed very small. That might be why Caesar focuses on their agility and speed and never gives a physical description of the little horses that so terrified his men. Uh, Caesar and Diodorus Siculus both write that the chariots are each pulled by two horses and ridden by two men. Tacitus says that the nobleman drives and his servant fights for him. As property of nobles, the chariots were expensive and expensively decorated. Propertius in the Elegies makes a remark about, quote, British chariots with carved yokes. Uh, the, the word for carved can also mean painted, but decorated, definitely. And archeological remains of bits such as the tiny one from Yorkshire were molded with patterns and inlaid with colored glass. Despite their size, the chariot horses were clearly well-respected and decorated by their own people and well feared by their enemies. They also apparently had minds of their own. Um, in the Ulster cycle of Irish mythology, Conal Chernak won an even fight against his enemy Lugoth only after Conal's own horse approached and took a bite out of Lugoth's side. So Conal won the fight fairly since he had made no promises for the actions of his little but fierce horse.
I would love to take questions if anyone has any. Yeah, I, I think Moe's Wi-Fi cut out, but OK, I, I have I, I don't have a question, really, but I have a comment, which is that um, the, the the chariot setup that the master rides while the, the, the servant fights, that's backwards in my head. Uh, I don't know if anyone it's I don't know, at least from the mythology I know or the army history that I know, it's uh, usually it's it's interesting also if you think about like scenes from Tacitus, especially where the chariots are like um, circling back and waiting so that they can come back and pick up their warriors. You know that the the nobleman is the one that's waiting outside the battle to come back and retrieve his man. Right. It's nice of him to come back. I feel like <laughs> Romans would not come back for their servants. Um, but yeah, that's cool. That's really cool. Um, I love how swift the small houses are. Our last speaker for today is Rose, who will tell us about the mysterious land of Thule. So take it away, Rose. Thule is a place uh, long debated about, both in regards to its location and if it was even a place to begin with. Written about by Pythias of uh, Mycelia, Thule has always held a sort of mythic element to it the northern edge of the world, the last named place, beyond which nothing could even imagine, nothing could be even imagined to exist. So it makes sense that the validity of its own existence would be questioned, especially when there is only one primary source of its existence. That being said, since it's less fun to take the opinion that it never existed and Pythias was just a liar, uh, let's look at uh, what survived about Thule, possible theories as to where Thule was located and why Scribo hated it so much. Uh, Scribo. Uh, starting off, there are three categories of information that have survived about Thule. Relative location based on travel time, day and night cycles, and other ast astronomical information, and possible inhabitants. The first of these categories doesn't actually tell much about the possible locations for Thule outside of a general limiter at best, as Pythias would have had no accurate way to measure length of time and where exactly in Britain he left from was also not known. Though for those curious, he recorded that it took about six days. The second gives an idea of just how North Thule was as it, it, as it includes information like record, recordings of Pythias himself in regards to latitude calculations, as well as observed day and night cycles. Specifically with the day and night cycles, it was said that on the solstices, there would either be no night or no day, depending on the solstice. The third possibility gives the most, possibly gives the most information of any of the categories. However, it is important to note that there are two main interpretations of the possible inhabitants. One is that the inhabitants lived near Thule, not actually on Thule, and two is that the inhabitants did live on Thule or at the very least interacted with Thule in some way. Uh, which you go with depends on where you want Thule to be. If you want Thule to be in Iceland, then you have to assume the former. If you want Thule to be Norway, you have to assume the latter. Now, these aren't the only two options for Thule. A few others include Shetland Islands, some other small islands located around Britain, or that it was a small island that at some point was swallowed by the ocean. Uh, looking at the inhabitants themselves, uh, according to Strebo's account of the information, they were uh, nourished by millet and other herbs, fruits, and roots. Uh, there was also mention of honey and a beverage made using grain and said honey. Uh, as mentioned above, depending on where you place these people, you get very different results to the question Oh, where Thule is located. If you place them on Thule, uh, it can't be Iceland, as Iceland had no found evidence of people at the time of Pythias, and Iceland did not have bees, whereas Norway did. Um, for a brief discussion on Strabo and why he was trying to undermine Pythias, um, Strabo is one of the main secondary sources we have uh, for Pythias, because very few of his works actually remain. Um, but Strabo is, uh, which is humorous, given his general dislike of Pythias. Uh, there's one main reason for this, and that is uh, Strabo's own ideas about where the habitable line fell. Um, 
if he was to believe Pythias that there were people living that far north, it would mean having to readjust his own ideas of where it was possible for people to live. That doesn't discount everything Strabo said, said about Pythias, but it is something to keep in mind when considering these sources. Uh, final note, um, which I will share a portion of my screen for, so you can see what I'm talking about. These are in order. So uh, about Thule that I just found interesting is how many different spellings there are for the name, which makes sense given different languages it was it was written in, as well as there not being the most standardized spelling. Uh, the commonly used spelling today of Thule seems to come from uh, Seneca's Medea. However, there are a number of other spellings. So the first one is Seneca's Medea. Uh, Thule, the second one, is the one that was commonly used in the main source I used for the project, which I will hold up after I finish sharing my screen. Um, the third one, it was used by Pitney the Elder, and the fourth one was used by uh, uh, Mela. They all have their similarities. As you can see, most of them have an H, except for the middle one. Um, but I thought it was interesting nonetheless. Um, still don't know where this name necessarily comes from, but it is something I found interesting, and this was the source. So you can actually see a little map on there. And Thule is up here. That's Thule. Um, you really, it's really small, but it is labeled as Thule. So, yeah. Thank you. That was that was awesome. So after all this research on Thule, where do you think Thule is? So, as I mentioned, it really depends on where you decide to put the people because it seems like in some and you can tell how commentary which way commentaries lean based off of how they describe it because um in this commentary they talk about how you know there's nothing necessarily tying the people he talks about to thule like those because you know um pisces only ex like his own writings only exist very fragmented and they're really only found in other people's writing about Pythias, like Strabo. Um, so based on this commentary, they, they're they like, they're not necessarily tied together. Um, in the article I did earlier in the semester, he obviously was in favor of Norway. And in his writing, he didn't even mention the fact that there's a possible chance that they're not linked together, given the fact that his whole piece on the ocean covers his whole trip, not just Thule. Um, so I think I think the 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 easiest pathway I think to find where Thule is is to just assume like the latter. So assume that Pythias is telling the truth and assume that people were located on Thule. And that brings you to Norway, and there's not really much of a debate you can have about it otherwise. Um, I actually kind of like the idea of Thule being just like a small island that got swallowed by the ocean, which is something that this commentary put forward, just because it's kind of funny, this idea of people are still talking about Thule and still wanting to find Thule, and the ocean ate it year, like hundreds of years ago, and you're not going to find it, um, you know, especially. Or even the fact that it was swallowed up before even Strabo was there, because there is a considerable amount of time between Pythias and Strabo, so that's also... It was just like a tiny rock. <laughs> the yeah, ocean that's, just ate. That's super fascinating. Um, yeah. Yep. Yeah, ocean needs a snack. Okay. Um, questions for uh, Rose. I just want to put out there real quick. I find those alternate spellings really interesting with the the, the period we're dealing with with Pythias because it shows those who have been looking at how to spell Greek words in Latin, sort of confusing bits with it. Because clearly yeah. it must have been a, an upsilon in the Greek, right? But then how do you make that upsilon in Latin? Well, you put a Y, but you want to make sure you still have that O sound. You have to put an O-U because otherwise you're making an O sound. And is the T the old theta that's just an aspirated T or is it the new theta that's just coming in in the Hellenistic period of a TH? So it's yeah. see how those all come manifest in different ways. Yeah, I was trying to see if I could find um, it pull out Thule specifically out of the Greek, because I think somewhere in this commentary it does, where it specifically pulls it out and show, because I think this particular commentary makes the comment about 
the spelling that they're using throughout it because they're using the second spelling um, throughout the whole thing. And I think it's just that was what they felt was the most literal from the Greek. Yeah, so there's a secondary problem there in that Greeks themselves start to uh, use OU or Omicron Upsilon a lot more in that Hellenistic period following the first writer to mark that U sound because their Upsilon is already shifting to an U sound. So, and as I understand it, the original writings are lost, right? Uh, I believe most of them are. My understanding is the fact that Pythia, Pythias's work on the ocean is extremely fragmented. Okay. So it's probably in like sentences, like you probably have a few sentences. And then as you go down the line, you kind of get like, this person mentions him, but it's also fragmented. So it's kind of fragments of fragments, so. Gotcha. Yeah, you know, without saying how he spelled it, I guess there's no way to know for sure. Yeah. Okay, um, that brings us to the end of everyone who's speaking. I hope have I missed someone out. Okay. Um, yeah, but that was really awesome, everyone. Um, and